So this afternoon, something a very bizarre phenomena is going to be happening around our nation, especially in Colorado and in the Northeast. Community is going to be happening, uh, some sort of community. There's going to be communities that are going to be formed around TV screens, okay? And on these TV screens, we're going to watch 22 men in tights <laughs> wrestling around with the skin of a pig. And when they take this pig skin and they cross over this white line in the grass, they're going to do these crazy dances and people are going to be excited. And there's going to be emotions. There's going to be excitement. There's going to be frustration. There's going to be disappointment. And there's going to be a reversal of hope. Uh, there's going to be angst and, and anger. And there's going to be high fives and cheering. All these emotions are going to happen as communities are forming around this common interest. This common interest that, that's that's kind of bizarre, but it's something I grew up with. Maybe you grew up with it. And somehow friendship is formed around this. And what's so crazy about this rather bizarre thing that will happen is that, is that it's actually an echo. It's a, it's a shadow of something that's very special. A shadow of something that we're made for. There's a reason why there's excitement when we're with people. There's a reason why there's, there's camaraderie that's built around difficulty and disappointment and excitement and victory. It's because we are made for community. We were made for community. It's hardwired into us. We all want to belong. We want to be accepted. We want to be a part of a group. But the reality is that in a football game today, uh, that, that experience of community is, is not going to be some sort of universal experience. For one, there's a lot of people in our country, in our world, that really don't care at all. Maybe that's some of you. Uh, another thing is half the people, at least, that watch the game today will leave disappointed. Uh, the ones in the Northeast, hopefully. Um, and, and another thing is a lot of people don't have family and friends to enjoy community with. That's why it's just a shadow. It's a shadow. There's a longing. It's an evidence of a, of a longing that we have that's hardwired into us. A longing to belong. Uh, a longing to, to belong to a group where you're a significant member of, where, where you're, you're valued. And, and that wiring for community is something we are created for, and everybody's looking for it. Whether, whether you're looking for it through a fraternity or a sorority in college, or you're learning, looking for it through a sports team, or a book club or some sort of pub environment or clubs or you're looking for it in your family or you're looking for it in a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You're looking to belong to a meaningful relationship and you're learning, looking to be accepted. I think this phenomena of CrossFit, I mean, it's just like it's community. It's a desire for community. There's all this desire to belong and that's normal. It's wired into us. It's something we're made for. God created us to be a contributing member to a diverse community that's united around something special. United around a common interest, an interest for His glory. And we are created for it, and it's something that we had in a very special way. And it's something that we lost in a very devastating way. And it's something that God is in the business of restoring through Jesus. And that's what the church is all about. It's about what God is doing to restore us to Himself to belong to Him, to be in Him and in, in Him in us, and to belong to each other. And that's what the church is. It's a community united to God and united to each other through Christ. And so we're going to look at that today and look at how the Gospel unites us together under God and for God's glory. And, and as we look at it, we're going to look at it through a, a process of a story. If you know me and if you've been around for a long time, I love to tell things as a story, to walk through what, what I call a biblical theology of community. To look at where it came from, what happened to it, what God's doing now and where it's headed. And, and my hope is, as we see this theology of community and how the gospel is, is restoring this community, we'll see, number one, why it's so essential for us. We don't do life groups here. We don't emphasize community here. We don't, we don't have you chat for 15 minutes before the service starts and chat for five minutes in the middle of the service and, and hang around for a long time just because it's a better way to get people to come and people want to be here more. We do it because it's what we were made for. We are made for community. And secondly, we want to see why it's so difficult. Because the reality is it's hard. 
if you've been a part of the crossing for a while, a lot of times people come into the crossing, and it's really exciting because I think we do a decent job with community. And so a lot of people are excited about belonging and, and about being a part of a family. And all of a sudden, like any sort of community, uh, things get tough. We t it turns out that we're imperfect people, and we disappoint each other, and we sin against each other, and, and it's hard. And we're going to look at why that is. Why is it hard? And hopefully we'll see why it's crucial that we push through that difficulty. And this coming year, why we push through the, the, the frustrations and the disappointments, and we bear the burdens for each other and stick with each other in the midst of the difficulties so that we could have the joy of being a part of the, of the family of God and so we could reflect His glory to the world. And so we're going to start where I love to start, which is in the very beginning. Start in the very beginning when God created community. See, when God's creating the earth in Genesis chapter 1, He, he creates it, and He's this king. And God, before the creation of the, of the earth, existed in what we would call a Trinitarian community as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, eternally existing in three persons united with diversity and unity. That's who God is. He is one God existing in diversity, but, but unified. And when He creates, He begins to speak. And as He speaks, he, he creates this existence, and it's beautiful, and it's good. And He creates, he creates the world, and He creates lights, and He creates uh, um, vegetation, and He creates animals. And, and on the climax of this creation, He creates humanity. And I want to look at uh, what's going on in Genesis 1, on day 6, when God creates humans. Genesis 1, 26 through 27. There's something remarkable that, that takes place. It says, Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over the, all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God says, let us make men in our image. Verse 27 goes on in a poetic fashion. It says, So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. And in the next few verses and throughout chapter 2, He's going to unpack something very significant. And that's as God creates humanity. He, he creates humanity in community. He creates male and female. These diverse people that are supposed to exist in unity to reflect this God, to be the image of this God who exists in diversity and unity. The joy that God has in Himself, in His community, He wanted to exist in humanity. And so He creates a new community. And that diversity is seen in, in male and female, but as we go on throughout the Bible, we learn that that diversity is, is seen in more ways than that. We are all different. There's different races. There's different cultural backgrounds. There's different strengths and personalities. Jamie and I love to talk about as we raise our two children, just looking at this older son and a younger daughter, looking at how their personalities are shaped around that. God, God has created things in this way. For there to be diversity. But He's created that diversity to work in a very special way. And we see that beautifully in Genesis 2. When he talks about Adam and Eve and how their diversity is supposed to exist for the good of each other. That God created us to use our strengths, to use our resources, to use our lives for the benefit of others. That alone, in isolation, it's not good. In fact, the only thing that's not good in Genesis 1 and 2 is a human alone. It's not good that man should be alone. And so God creates a diverse human, a different human that, that complements that man, this woman. And as, and as man and woman experience their strengths and use their strengths, each of them, to bless the other, something of the image of God is, is shining. The image of God is a, is a funny phrase. I feel like it's something we use a lot, but you might not understand what it is. And by talking about the image of God, this is, it's, a, it's a picture of what God's like. It's a manifestation of God's character. So, so God is something, and to show the world what He is, He creates these humans to say, I want you to show the world about me, about my character, about what I'm like. And, and, and so important in that is this idea of community. That, that as a community, we shine the image of God beautifully. And so from the beginning, 
Humans were given gifts and strengths and talents and resources to bless others and to make much of God. And so as they seek to make much of their Creator and to bless one another, God is glorified and, and there's a great joy that happens. And so this has important, uh, important um, significance for the way you think about uh, the way you think about marriage, for the way you think about family, for the way you think about friendship, for the way you think about work. All right, let's talk about work for a second. Your, your gifts, your strengths are given. The design is that you're given strengths to bless people and make much of God. And that's why you're given strengths, to bless people with, with your talents and with your training and with your skill set as you make much of the God who has created you. And so, so we cultivate this earth and we exercise dominion and we do good and we, we try to bless people and make much of God and reflect His glory as we do these things with joy. That's the way work's supposed to be. And marriage is supposed to be similar where, where a man uses his strengths and his gifts to, to bless and lift up his wife and a wife uses her gifts and strengths to bless and lift up her husband and there's joy and they make much of God in their marriage. The same thing with friendship. That's the way it was made to be, but that's not our experience, is it? That's the way it was made to be. That's what we were designed for. That's why you want friendship. That's why you want community. That's why you want to belong, because you were made for it. And yet, even in all that desire to belong, even in, in the desire to, to be married or in the desire to have meaningful friendships, things fall apart, don't they? You finally get what you wanted, and it's a lot harder than you expected it to be. That's part of the story. In Genesis chapter 3, some hard things happen. We call it the fall. Where for the first time ever, after God has created this very good world with this very amazing community in, in which He dwells as the center of these relationships and these people seek to make much of God and to bless each other, for the first time ever, a creature decides to disobey the words of their Maker. For the first time ever, a creature decides, I don't want to make much of God. I now want to make much of myself. And I don't want to make much of God by blessing other people and using my gifts and strengths to bless others. I want to make much of, of myself at the expense of other people. And there's this scene where a serpent sneaks into the garden and tempts Eve, the first woman, to eat of this tree. And Eve is found in isolation. Her husband's not there helping her. And as she's found in isolation, the temptation comes to, to, to doubt God's goodness, to doubt the severity of, of what he has said the penalty would be if he disobeys the words to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and the woman turned from God. I'm going to read from Genesis 3, starting in verse 6. It says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. All of a sudden, there's, for the first time ever, there's shame in relationship. There's embarrassment. There's a separation in Adam and Eve, a separation between humans. This community is separated because of rebellion. It goes on to say, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. There's shame before God for the first time ever. There's an embarrassment before God, a sense of distance, a sense of shame, and they hide. And they hide from God. And the Lord God pursues them and he says this, But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, uh, the, the woman who you gave me, uh, who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree. And I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent, you deceived me. And I ate. Their rebellion led to separation between themselves and separation before God. 
Sin always leads to brokenness in relationships. Always. And in this first experience of sin, in this first experience of rebellion, the motive is for self-exaltation. So if we remember that, that humans were created in community to make much of God as they bless one another, use their strengths and their resources and their gifts to bless each other, which is, which is what it is to bear the image of God because that's what God does. He used his strength and his power to create a world, a world that would be a blessing to us. He filled it with good things to give to us, we read about in Genesis 2. He gives us these things for our good. That's what he's like. He uses his strength to bless and to do good. And that's what he created us to do. And for the first time ever, people are using their strengths to exalt themselves. And then after being caught, they use their strengths to protect themselves. Their self-protection. It was the woman. It was the woman that you gave to me, God. It's your fault. And it's the woman's fault. And the woman says, it was the serpent. It's his fault. And we want to protect ourselves from responsibility. And in that self-protection... There's no hope of reconciliation, ever. As we seek to exalt ourselves over God at the expense of others, reconciliation never happens. And that's what continues to happen over and over and over, climaxing in Cain. In Cain, for the first time ever, we see something tragic. Uh, We see the culmination of this despair. Cain walks up and he sees his brother Abel. And as he looks at his brother Abel, he sees the strength. He's the son, two sons of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. And Cain, this, as this rebellion multiplies, Cain sees Abel and he sees Abel's strength and he sees Abel's gifts and he's jealous of Abel and he's jealous of Abel's acceptance and he's jealous of this approval of Abel and he murders his brother. And this is the end of this desire for self-exaltation. This is where the path goes. It goes to destruction and to death. And that's what God said it goes to. It goes to destruction and death. And, and we see this kind of flow and it fills the earth. And generation after generation after generation spreads. And the earth is full of these people that have a longing for community, but have a desire to make much of themselves at the expense of others. And this affects everything also, doesn't it? Now you know where the hardship in marriage comes from. A, a husband wants to exalt himself against his wife, over his wife, at the expense of his wife, and to use all of his strengths and resources to make much of himself and to be the man and, and, to, and to make much of himself before others at the expense of his family or at the expense of others. And a wife simultaneously wants to make much of herself at the expense of her husband and, and enter this tension. And so now when the tension starts, the husband is, is lording over his wife, which is a part of the curse, and the wife hates that, and so she wants to come back over the husband, and it's this competition. And it's this, it's this give and give and fight and strife, and that's where it comes from. Self-protection, self-promotion, self-preservation. The same thing happens in your workplace. A, a human wants to, it's a competitive environment. You want to make much of yourself. You want to exalt yourself over your employees, and now it's this competition, and there's disappointment when others do well, and there's jealousy, and there's frustration. And there's strife because we want to be, we want people to approve of us and we want to be accepted and we want to be valued and we want to be esteemed highly. And so we try to climb the ladder at the expense of others for our own glory. The same thing happens among roommates. Man, my roommate never does this and he never does that and she never does this and I'm always the one doing this and don't they know I, that I'm busy with this and, and self-protection, self-promotion. Thinking about our self-interests, our own interests, and we exalt ourselves above others and at the expense of others so that we can feel good about who we are. And every experience of brokenness in our world is because of the same desire, a desire to exalt ourselves at the expense of others instead of exalting God as we bless others. And the same thing's true as a church, isn't it? Approach life group. Or, or your experience with Sunday gatherings. And it's like, what is there for me? What am I getting? I'm not getting enough out of this. I'm not getting enough. I, I'm thinking about what I need and what I want, and they're disappointing me, and that's not what I like, and, and they're not contributing, and they're not noticing me, and they're not, they're not helping me. They're not blessing me. This isn't doing it for me. That is the curse at work in our hearts. And we all know it. We all know it. 
And every experience of loneliness, every experience of isolation, every experience of disappointment with friendships and relationships is a part of this, of this difficulty as we, as we exist in this time where things just aren't exactly right, are they? It's difficult. But praise God that He didn't leave us at Genesis 3. In Genesis 3.15, there's a promise. And the promise is, is a little shadow of this redemption that's coming. And, and as we see the Bible story unfold and unfold and unfold, we see this division multiply and we see it fleshed out in all these different areas. But we see the climax come when God Himself comes to make things right. In Mark 10, we see an amazing picture. Jesus has come into the world. God has taken the initiative, and we'll talk about in Philippians 2, He decided to use, because this is what God is like, this is His image, He decided to use who He is to rescue others, to bless others, to serve others. And so He enters into this world at a great cost to Him. He becomes vulnerable. He pursues people who have run from Him. He runs after people who have hurt Him and offended His holiness. And he's loving people, and he's ministering to people, and he's blessing people, and he's serving people, and he's healing people. He's doing good to people. And he's got these 12 disciples, and they don't quite get it yet. They still think about greatness, and they think about life the way that humans did after the fall. And you have this scene in in Mark 10, where James and John, two of Jesus' closest friends, who have been around Jesus as much as anybody, ask Jesus this question. They still think Jesus is coming to to be great and to be esteemed and to be above people and to lord over people. And they're like, we want that. Jesus, we want to be with you as you reign over people because we want to be esteemed. We want to exalt ourselves over our friends. We want people to think that we're great. So they they ask Jesus this question. You know, can we sit? Would you give us, grant us the the opportunity, the permission to sit at your right hand and on your left hand in your glory? Like, you're going to be on the throne. We want to be right by you because we want people, we want to be like in a snapshot, you know, on like the State of the Union, we just want to like be there with you. And we want people to see how great we are. And, and what's amazing about this scene is the other ten hear it. And listen to what it says, they hear about this question, and listen to what it says that they say. And this is in Mark 10, uh, 41. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. Are they frustrated? They're like, James and John, you guys don't get it. This is about being humble and about laying our lives out. No, they're indignant because they're like, man, you guys asked for it before we did. Like, I want to be at the right hand, and I want to be at the left hand. I want to promote myself against you. I want to be more important than you. And so they promote themselves. There's this frustration, and Jesus just stops them. And to listen to what he said. Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, so in the world people that don't know God, the rulers, they lord it over them. They use their strengths to lord over people, to exalt themselves against people, over people, to to try to make themselves more important than other people. And their great ones exercise authority over them. That's what greatness is in the world, is having authority and prestige and honor and significance and praise of men. That's what greatness is in the world. Listen to what he says. But it shall not be so among you. That's not what God's people are like, Jesus says. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be the first among you must be slave of all. Every time I see this, it strikes me. He doesn't say must serve occasionally. and He doesn't say you know, must occasionally do good for other people. He says be. It's an identity word. Be a servant. Be a slave. Meaning seeing your existence as wrapped up in blessing others and doing good for others and serving others. You're like, man, that's crazy. Well, you know what's crazy is what he says next. He says, for even the Son of Man, referring to himself, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus had every resource that anybody could have. He had had equality with God. He was in a a community of perfect harmony and fellowship with the Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus came. He didn't consider that equality with God as something to to be grasped, to be held onto, to promote and protect himself. Man, they all rejected me. They've 
offended us. They have sinned against us. And I just need to protect our glory here and protect what we've got going because what we as the Trinitarian community have is good. And, and we can't change that. And what Jesus, he didn't consider that something to be held on to, but rather he made himself nothing. And, and he became a human. And he, and he came into all of the suffering. He came into the brokenness. He, he endured uh, mocking. He endured frustration. He endured isolation. He endured the, the junior high years of awkwardness. Right? No offense to junior highers. But, you know, I mean, like, it's tough, right? Isn't it awkward? Friendships are hard. There's cliques and there's frustration. There's, there's, there's people that are just constantly trying to promote themselves against each other and making fun of people. That's, I mean, I think everybody knows that's a hard season for kids as they, as they begin to try to claw over each other in school and in, in relational circles. He went through that. One of the most baffling verses, as Jesus says, the, the Son of Man, had, uh, foxes have holes, like they've got homes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Like Jesus was homeless and wandering, and he created the world. He created the world and he enters into this isolation, the, the, this despair, this difficulty. And, and, and it begins to grow. And, and now there's opposition against them from rulers who want to exalt themselves over Jesus. And, and it comes to the point where there's mocking, there's false accusation, and he endures it alone. His 12 closest friends, one of them betrays him significantly, the most epic betrayal imaginable. And the rest of them eventually run away too. And then there he is before a judge being falsely accused, being beaten, being mocked, being taunted, being spit on, being made fun of, being stripped naked and hung up on a tree for the world to see. That's God. God is hanging on a tree naked and exposed and alone. But what's astonishing is all of that is nothing compared to what happened on that tree. There comes a point on that tree when Jesus cries out the most devastating words that I can imagine. He says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, on that tree, for the first time and only time ever, there's brokenness in the Trinitarian community. There's a separation between the Father and the Son. Their relationship was torn apart because when Jesus cried out, there was no answer. The God who had everything that you could have willingly was torn apart in His community and literally was torn apart in the person of Jesus. And the brokenness in His community that He willingly went into that isolation as Jesus hung alone where every human has deserted Him. And now the Father Himself has forsaken Him. His forsakenness and His isolation in that moment was so that our forsakenness and our, our isolation could be mended. So our brokenness could be healed. So that our, our, our separation between God and us and our separation between each other could be restored, reconciled. This is the ministry of reconciliation that Jesus came to accomplish. He was severed. The Godhead was torn apart so that we could be welcomed back into relationship. He took the penalty of our rebellion. The sin that separated us from God and the sin that separates us from one another, Jesus bore it. He paid its debt. It's remarkable. And as He does that, He restores us back to Himself. And He gives us His Holy Spirit. And as He gives us His Holy Spirit, He's changing us. He's changing us to be like He is, to once again bear His image. This is what discipleship is all about. You might be familiar with the phrase, we're going to be conformed to the image of God. Well, that, that conformed to the image of Christ is looking back at we were created in His image. We rebelled against it, so we're rebellious image bearers. And now through Christ, He's making us back to be righteous image bearers. But just like in the beginning, that image bearing, which is what discipleship is all about, is showing the world what Jesus is like. It's following Jesus in His ways. It happens most beautifully, most powerfully, as it always has, in community. As we, as we love one another. 
Jesus said so much. He said, it's by your love for one another that people will know that you are my disciples. It is this interrelational experience of love and grace and forgiveness and reconciliation that shines the glory of Christ. In fact, it's in the difficulty of relationships that we most shine the glory of Christ because his glory was most shown and manifested as he paid the price for our sin. It is precisely in the hardship of community. It's in the hardship of your marriage. It's in the hardship of your life group. It's in the hardship of your parenting and your work experience. As you bear with one another, as you forgive one another, as you show grace to one another, as you use your gifts and your resources and become vulnerable and bless other people that God has made much of once again. And that's something the world doesn't see. Friends will form around a football game because it's fun and we high-five and we get excited. Friendship around difficulty. Friendship when you hurt each other. Friendship when you disappoint each other. Friendship when you frustrate each other. That's what the world doesn't know. Because that's when the world runs away. And unfortunately, I think that happens a lot inside Christianity. The communities we have are very similar to the world a lot of times. We gather around affinity. We like the same things and we like the same whatever, so we're all friends. But being around people that are different from us is hard. Embracing the diversity, embracing the difficulty and the frustration is something that's very difficult. So we moan and we groan and we gripe and we complain about how disappointed and frustrated we are with this person or that person or this person in our family or that person in our family or this person in our life group. And it's just not doing it for me. I don't know. I, I'm not in love with them anymore. I don't really enjoy life group anymore. You know, this job is just like people are too frustrating and difficult. Well, welcome to our existence. We are frustrating and difficult people. I'm a really frustrating and difficult person. If you've stuck with me as a friend for the past several years, it's like evidence of God's grace in your life, right? Um, but it's true. It's true. If you get to know me more, if I get to know you more, we're going to find out that we have weaknesses and difficulties. And that's, that's good. Because it gives us the opportunity to bless one another and use the strengths and the gifts that each of us have to, to do good and to bless and to create a, a community where everybody's pouring into each other. And so the tendency is it gets tough and we run away. And I want to just ask you guys this year, let's just change our thinking. This is something that God has bought with the blood of Jesus, community. Can we give thanks to God for what it is? Not for what we want it to be, not for what we hope it will one day become, not for what we think everybody should be like, but give thanks for what it is and all of its messiness and all of its disappointments and its frustrations. Thank God for giving us people that will stick with us and giving us His Spirit to help us stick with each other. Thank Him for what it is. When we, when we want it to be something, we want marriage to be something, we have these expectations of perfection, we're constantly disappointed. Well, thank God for somebody that's going to stick with you and ask Him for help by His Spirit to stick with them. Uh, same thing with a life group. It's exciting. We just, you know, we're growing and whatever, and now we multiplied, and it's frustrating. There's not as many people. People are moving. Things are frustrating. That person never hangs out with me anymore. They don't call me. They don't invite me. And it's just not, you know, it's not doing it for me anymore. Man, this is just life. I mean, we're all broken. We're not perfect. Let's thank God for what He's given us. Give thanks. Give thanks for people. Don't expect perfect people. You're not a perfect person. I just want to encourage us this year to be grateful. And again, not for the ideal that we hope community or marriage or parenting will be, but grateful for the opportunity to live and to bless and to use the gifts that God has given us to make much of Him and to bless others. Right, there's, um, think a lot about when we think about this is marriage, this is um, life group, community, work. This sense of like, man, it's just not, it's not, it's just become a burden for me to go. You know, it's, or, or it's a burden for me to host. Or, or it's a burden for me to lead. Or it's a burden for me to hang out. And it's just not very life giving anymore. And I would say that's not the question that we should be asking. The question is, are you a life giving person? Do you approach your life group? Do you approach your marriage as one who's to breathe life into people, to bless people, to do good to people at great expense to yourself? It's exhausting, is it not? It's exhausting to host. Those of you who host, it's exhausting. You, you, you host people in your house, you have people over, you work, you do whatever, it's exhausting. You know what makes it not exhausting? Giving up. But that won't satisfy you because you still want community. You're made for it. 
The better approach is for everybody to come to be life-giving. And I would encourage you, for those who host, uh, for, the, for the rest of you, if you don't host, as you think about going into people's homes, what does it look like to be a life-giving contributor to that community? Use your gifts and your resources to bless, to acknowledge people for what they're doing, and to give thanks to them, and, and to care for them, and to leave a home more clean than it was when you got there. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's like practical, but that's what bearing the image of God is like. It's using my time, my resources, to, to bless other people as they make much of God because I am their servant. I'm a slave of this life group community. I exist for their good, to use everything God's given me to bless and to love and contribute. And if everybody's focusing on that, then you're going you're gonna to be, and you're going to enjoy it. You're going to be given life. But if you focus on what you're not getting, and you start to gripe and moan and complain and be disappointed and run away, that doesn't do good for anybody. And that's exactly what happens because of the fall. That's, that's the old nature. That's the flesh, that's the sin, is giving up, running away, griping, moaning, complaining. Philippians chapter 2 is this amazing passage where, where Paul is calling on this community, this new church community, to, to be like Jesus as they consider the interests of others as more significant than, than their own. And, and he climaxes this, and we'll end in this verse, but with, with a picture of Jesus, who gave of everything he had for the good of others. And then right after that, he says, now, you know, you're going to have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, because God, but God's going to be working in you. And, and immediately transitioning from that, he, he talks about this griping and this complaining and this frustration and this everybody's, everybody's disappointed and frustrating. He says, this is going to kill community. Don't let this be in your community. Instead, bless one another. It says, so that you might shine like lights in the world. And that's what I want to see in, in my own life. I have some areas, and I've had some areas this week where I just had to do some repenting. Because I've just seen frustration and disappointment in people and, and anger and just exhaustion. I want to just quit and give up. And it's just like, well, that's not what God does. That's not what God is like. He pursues us again and again and again. But I don't want to say it's not a burden. It is a burden. In fact, community, like we said, is most beautifully seen as we bear each other's burdens, as we stick with each other when it's hard, as we become vulnerable to people again even after they've hurt us and we don't run away and avoid them, as we do serve and we get tired because of it, because that's what Jesus did for us. He bore our burden, the burden of our sin on a tree. So when we bear with people, when we bear with imperfect people, we actually are shining the glory of God in a very special way in a very significant way, in a way that's not seen in other contexts. Embrace the reality that community, marriage, work, friendship, life group, is a burden. And embrace the reality that you're a burden. And I'm a burden. And let's seek God's help to bear with one another in those imperfections, in those weaknesses, and to bless one another. The application goes, and this is just Christian ethics, I and mean, this is what it is to be a Christian. And I think about teenagers in homes. Um, for those of you that are teenagers in the room, or, or, or you're in junior high or in grade school, what does it look like to be a contributor, a life-giving member to your house? I don't feel like people challenge teenagers and junior high kids towards them too, too much. But you guys are filled with the Spirit. If you follow Jesus, what does it look like to bless your family, to bless your parents, to do good in your home, to bless your siblings? What does it look like for you to do that with roommates, for those of you that have roommates and aren't married? What does it look like to be a life-giving member of your home? That's not always moaning and groaning about what you're not getting or what people aren't doing for you, but that's seeking opportunities to bless and to do good. What does it look like in your workplace? What we're asking is, what does it look like to bear the image of God? Or what does it look like to be a disciple? And as communities, as we do that to one another, we shine the glory of God beautifully. We talked about this yesterday at Cody and Alexandria's wedding. In 1 John 4, 7 through 12, it talks about God as love, but it says, it's God is love. And I, and I think of this passage like, let's say this is the ground level right here. And God is love, but nobody's ever seen him. He's like a, a root system, you know? Nobody's ever seen this root system. And it has these statements about how he showed his love. It says, in this, the love of God was made manifest. So in this, the love of God kind of like broke into the world so we could see it. He says that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And that's where God broke into the world, through the incarnation. We just celebrated that at Christmas. He breaks into the world to show us his love as he pursues us. 
He pursues people who have sinned against Him. He pursues people who had run from Him. He pursues people who, who had hurt Him and who will continue to hurt Him. He pursued us through His incarnation so that we could have life. He, he emptied Himself so that He could give us life. He used His resources as God to give life to us. And then it says, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So not only did He pursue us, but that He laid His life down for us. He sacrificed Himself for us. He was selfless. He died at the greatest expense possible. It's like the tree now is like branches. Like now we can really see what the glory of God's like. Now we can really understand what it means to say God is love. But the next verses just baffle me. Beloved, if God so loved us, if God loved us like that, through pursuing us and, and laying His life down for us, we also ought to love one another. In the same way, through our pursuit of one another, continually a renewed pursuit, pursuing each other again and again, a faithful pursuit, and through a selfless laying down of our lives. If you're exhausted from pouring into people, thank you for bearing the image of God because it was exhausting for Him to lay His life down for us. I want you to be encouraged. You shine God's glory in your exhaustion. In, in the difficulty. It's not something to run away from, but something to embrace. And then it, 1 John, that section ends with this. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. It reminds me of a story that I've told before about a grade school kid in an art class. A kid who had a hard time just focusing and he could never focus and was always fidgeting and moving around. But on a particular day in this art class, he was just totally focused and he was locked in. And the teacher, the teacher walks over him to see what he's drawing. She looks over him. We'll say his name's Johnny. And she says, Johnny, uh, what are you drawing, Johnny? And he goes, I'm drawing a picture of God. And she says, well, Johnny... Nobody knows what God looks like. And he says, oh, they will in a minute. <laughs> it's cute, but the reality is nobody's seen God. But I want to say, they will in a minute. As we love one another like that, as we pursue one another like that, as we run after one another like that, as we sacrifice ourselves for one another and use all the gifts and all the talents and all the strengths and the resources that God has given you to bless others and to make much of God, people will see the love of God and we can explain to them the reason for the hope that's in us. Where does this come from? It's not that we've loved God, but it's that He loved us first. We can tell them about what Christ has done to demonstrate this for us. And that's my hope. That's our prayer for this year to come is that we would continue to stay committed to one another like God continues to stay committed to us. That we'd continue to pursue one another and invest in one another and lay our lives down for one another just as God continues to pursue us and, and to care for us and as He laid His life down for us. And as we do that, that the world would know that we are His disciples and that God would, through our community, draw more and more people to Himself so that they would be reconciled to the God who made them. So let's pray to that end together.